Like listening to podcasts just like this one from the team at Witch? Well, we've got some good news. All our podcasts are now available to listen to on YouTube and YouTube Music. So whether you like listening to Get Answers, Witch Shorts or Witch Money, all episodes can now be listened to directly on YouTube or through the YouTube Music app. To find them, just search for the podcast you'd like to listen to. YouTube's additional functionality also means that you can now read along with subtitles as you listen. Don't panic though, all which podcasts are still available to listen to elsewhere too. So wherever you listen, we'll see you soon. Hello and welcome, I'm Harry Kind. And I'm Grace Farrell. And this is Get Answers for living your best consumer life. When life gives you questions, which Get Answers. Spring is finally here and the great outdoors is calling. Camping holidays might seem budget friendly, but if you're new to it, there's a lot of equipment you need to buy and costs can soon stack up. So how can you bring the comforts of home to the great outdoors without spending a fortune? Where should you land between the bare necessities and bare grills? And ultimately, how do you avoid waking up in a puddle? We'll be answering all of these questions in today's episode. If you're a fan of the show, it would help us hugely if you could leave us a rating and a review. It won't take long, I promise, and it helps us reach new audiences. Right, Grace, are you much of a camper? Do you know, I I do actually really like camping. I think my first camping experiences have been festivals. I go to festivals every year. I camp, sometimes I glamp. I've been camping with my children. It is something I really enjoy, actually. And and this year, we're, we're supposed to be going camping with our school, all the parents and kids from school. So that'll be interesting. It sounds like a massive, great big social experiment. (laughs) What could possibly go wrong? (laughs) Yeah, it sounds like a movie, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I've never been to a festival. Never camped at a festival. I know, it's terrible, isn't it? But we used to go camping in a place called New Gale, right by the sea, which was just like surfing camping. So you'd go and everyone would just spend the day on the beach and then be on that campsite. And I like it. I like a bit of getting outdoors. I like cooking outdoors. I am always slightly put off, A, by tents getting wet, and B, by campsites always being a little bit of a weird place, lots of people around. I would quite happily get out and and go a little bit wild. Well, I'm really excited that we're joined today by Sean Lewis. Uh, Sean is an award-winning travel journalist, the creator of the hugely popular The Girl Outdoors blog, and author of The Girl Outdoors book, so hello and welcome, Sean. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. And we're also joined by Joel Bates, who is the go-to guy for tent testing here at Witch, because we also test tents, who knew? And he's going to be telling us exactly what he does to test tents. First of all, though, you've got a challenge for Grace. Am I right in saying that? Uh, yes, you are, yes. I've got a tent down here, um, which... You'd like to pitch it in the studio, Grace? So you want me you want me to pitch a tent in the studio? Yes. You won't have to peg it out because we can't stick <laughs> pegs into the carpet. But yeah, if you'd like to give it a little go. Okay. See how you see how you get on? I'll I'll give it a go. What kind of tent is it? It's a backpacking tent, so it's really small, quite compact. I chose it for that reason, so hopefully it'll fit in the studio and won't sort of drown <laughs> drown us all out. But yeah, it also goes up in quite a unique way compared to most tents that you might come across. So that's why I picked it, see how I get on with it. You'll have to tell me how what it is then. I can't stop putting it up if it's a unique way of assembling it that I've never done. Well, there's instructions. Oh, OK. No, I'll be there to give you a hand. I'll be okay. there to give you a hand. Well, I guess you should get on with that then. And okay. while we do that, we are going to be talking about camping. All right. Let's see if I can pitch the tent in the time it takes to record the podcast. OK, so they're unpacking that tent. Very much not a natural camping environment is this basement studio. But, Sean, right, camping, I feel like it's something that like a lot of people do as kids. It's something that can feel like a little bit ridiculous almost, a little bit uh, masochistic. But give us the pitch, right? Why should we be out camping? Camping is a funny one because I think a lot of us have memories as kids. I can clearly remember the slightly mouldy smell of my dad's canvas tent. But I still think I really enjoyed those trips. That might just be nostalgia. Camping has come a long way and a lot of us camp um, maybe just in the middle of summer or we go to festivals. But a lot of people are also a bit scared of camping. They're not sure if it's for them. I'm obviously a big fan of camping. Um, I think it is a really, really wonderful way to get outside, sleep under the stars, Mm. maybe put your phone away for a bit and kind of relax into outdoor living. But I can see why it's not for everyone. Um, You've got to deal with the weather. You've got to deal with um, learning to use new kit. 
I really do think it's worth giving it a go, though, if you've never tried camping, because um, it, it's really relaxing. Mm. If you do get a rare, sunny, lovely, balmy day in Britain, it's pretty magical. It's also a really affordable way to get out and go on a little holiday. And there are some surprisingly gorgeous campsites in the UK as well. So it is, um, it's well worth giving it a go. And, and you're all about that kind of giving it a go mentality, that, those bite-sized adventures. How can we all fit that into our daily lives, do you think? Definitely. So I think you also see pictures of really gnarly wild campers who are up mountainsides with the wind blowing their tents away. I personally don't enjoy that very much. I I quite enjoy it being camping being good fun. So I think there's nothing wrong with going camping for just a day or two in the nice in nice weather and properly enjoying yourself and also working up to those maybe those more adventurous camps that you might have seen on telly or something. You see Bear Grylls off doing. Um, You can start in your local campsite and make it really fun. Go away with your mates or with your family. It doesn't need to be tough. It doesn't need to be a challenge. And I suppose if you're doing it like just at a weekend, fairly last minute, then you can check the weather. (laughs) Like you could just go, oh, it's nice weather this weekend. Let's go camping. Absolutely. I think people are intimidated that it might be cold and wet. And that, is, that can be really mm. miserable if you get it a bit wrong. So I would always say, leave it last minute, check the weather, go to a nice campsite, maybe go to a campsite with things you want, like a hot shower or some nice loos and enjoy yourself. And yeah, you'll, you'll learn to love it. So, so those things that kind of put people off, maybe the mouldy canvas, maybe the lack of a hot shower. Are people right in thinking that that's what camping's like? How can people avoid those pitfalls, really, on a camping trip? So you don't actually need loads of kit for camping, but you do need the basics, and they need to be half decent if you might encounter some dodgy weather. So you need to be warm and dry. That seems obvious, but that is how you're going to have a nice time. So I think getting the basics right is important, but it doesn't have to be expensive. You can get those bits. You could borrow them from friends and family, or once you've invested in some okay camping equipment that does the job, you've got that forever if you look after it. So it's not, it doesn't have to be a, a stumbling block. After that, I always take a few luxuries, like a pillow, a bottle of wine, just to make it make it fun. It doesn't have to be a hardship. And I would also say pick a campsite that is friendly and relaxed, maybe has a nice view in the morning. Some campsites are pretty posh, actually, mm. and have things like you can have a barbecue or a fire pit. Um, some of them even have, I don't know, they're in gorgeous places where you can go to the beach mm. after you've woken up in your tent, which is pretty special. So make it easy for yourself. So someone without a view currently, you can't go to the beach from the Witch Studio. We've got actually what looks like half a tent in the studio right now. That was very quick. I mean, we're talking like three minutes maybe. How's it going, guys? I'd say it's going pretty well. Joel, you're very calm influence when it comes to putting up tents. It's almost like we're kind of just reading each other's minds. It's very intuitive. That's because it's not raining right now in the studio. It's not raining. It's not dark. You're not against like a massive gale force wind. But that's a really interesting looking tent with odd poles. Uh, Just to describe, I can see the inside bit, which is a technical term. And then there's very kind of like arcing poles over the edge which kind of like divide at the bottom it looks a bit like a biosphere almost yeah so the reason why this tent is quite unique compared to other tents you might find is that it's actually all one pole so rather than having to kind of fiddle around with lots of different sized poles that you know might be color coded and might need to be fed through the canvas this is all one pole and it doesn't need to be fed through the fly sheet at all you actually just put the frame together and then you just clip the ends of the pole into little loops that are in the corners of the tent and then there's little hooks that are on the um the inner in the bedroom bit that you just kind of hook onto the pole and then that's it and you just put the fly sheet over the top and peg it like that technically looking at that tent looks different than what i remember has much changed in in camping would you say in the last few years yeah this is quite a modern example of a tent it's a two-man that you could take into um, quite tough conditions because it's fully waterproof mm. and what the guys have done is pitch the inner tent which isn't waterproof that's an inner shell which has a built-in ground sheet so that goes on wherever you're pitching your tent and now they're putting on the outer fly which is waterproof and will withstand the wind and rain so this is a it's quite a, an expensive one but it's a really nice two-man tent if you were going into slightly more adventurous terrain because i feel like a lot of things over the last even in the time that i can remember the last 20 years have made camping so much easier so like a pop-up tent for example on the real basic end of things this kind of development even an led torch is so much better than the massive mag lights that you used to have is is that something that you find especially with those like little luxury moments that you can have camping definitely it's changed so much there's some really quite technologically advanced kit out there 
What I've noticed a lot as well as being more reliably weatherproof is things are a lot lighter. You can stick them in your backpack. They're a lot less bulky to store when you're not camping. And um, also the more affordable end of the market is pretty decent these days. So I think the days of mouldy canvas are gone. (laughs) And when you're finding those places to camp, whether it's wild, whether it's a site, how do you go about finding a good place to camp? Yeah, so just in case anyone doesn't know, wild camping essentially means that you're away from a traditional campsite, so you're not paying for a pitch. You are heading off into the mountains, say, and you are pitching your tent where you fancy. And it's not actually legal everywhere in the UK. Mm. So it's legal in Scotland um, if you follow certain rules. It is legal in parts of Dartmoor National Park. You can do it in other parts of the world. So that's what wild camping is. It's a little bit more adventurous. Traditional camping, which I also absolutely love, you're rocking up at a campsite, you pay usually not very much for a pitch for a night and you set up your tent. And both are absolutely brilliant and there's loads of really gorgeous campsites in the UK. That has also changed, I think. I think when I was a child, campsites were pretty bog standard (laughs) and now they're really gorgeous and you can have, yeah, they're really quite exciting and as I said, they're pretty affordable. So it's a more affordable way to go on a lovely you know, adventure with your tent. You can also find glamping sites, which, as the name suggests, are posh camping. So you might get there and there's a safari tent or a beautiful yurt and they're a bit more expensive. But if you're not sure if rough and ready camping is for you, they can also be a nice way to get started with camping. Just looking over at at Tent Corner, it looks kind of finished. Am I right in saying that's finished? I think it's as finished as it's going to be because we can't peg the the outer skin into the floor. But it's I would say it's it's assembled, isn't it? Yeah. As you said, it's about as assembled as it can be because we can't peg out the fly sheet. And moderately painless. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, I'm not I'm definitely not an expert in putting up tents. And uh, that was actually really easy. These kind of unique poles are much easier. It was almost like they were made of magnets, the way they just kind of clip together. Yeah, very, very painless, I would say. Fantastic. Well, Sean, how would someone find a good campsite? Is there like an Airbnb or booking.com for the camping world? There's loads of ways to look for lovely campsites. So, for example, there's a website called Hip Camp, which lists really cute campsites. Um, so you can look by region if you're going on holiday to, say, Cornwall, you could have a quick quick look on there. There's also lots of lovely books. So a book that springs to mind is Tiny Campsites, which does what it says on the tin. Lots of cute little campsites in really beautiful pockets of Britain. And if you're, say, someone who's a city slicker, maybe you don't have a car, are there ways of going camping that's quite easy? Are there campsites that are like places that you you would really recommend for people who can't necessarily fill up a, a pickup truck with gear? Absolutely. So there are actually a surprising amount of campsites that you can reach by train or on a bus. Um, If you have a quick look around, there's some lovely guides online to those. And although it's tempting, you don't need to fill a big car boot with kit. You can go light, especially if it's just for a couple of days. Even if you're going to a festival, festivals quite often now offer discounts if you go by bus or on your bike even. So if you can load up a bike or, or sling it all in a backpack, you can still go camping. And where are the very best places in the UK that you've been camping? Oh, that's a hard one. I think I'd probably have to say Scotland because firstly, you can wild camp if you um, follow certain rules. So you can set up your tent in some truly spectacular places. I've camped on beaches in the Outer Hebrides, which is it really is a real adventure. And um, as long as you dodge the rain. (laughs) (laughs) And also the established campsites that are there too are really lovely, really relaxed. You can get up in the morning and have some haggis for breakfast. It's pretty special camping in Scotland. At the other end of the country, I'd say Cornwall is amazing too. Um, I can think of a campsite right down in the south of Cornwall where you can wake up and walk to a beautiful beach. And it feels like it could be the Caribbean until you put your feet in the water. (laughs) (laughs) Well, on that note of the best places in, in the UK, the witch travel team asked a similar question to nearly 2,000 witch members, which is, where's your favourite countryside walk? Grace, you've got the results. Where came out on top for that? Yes, well, they rated walks around the UK on lots of different things, wildlife facilities and scenery, that kind of thing. And the top three were, I'm probably going to pronounce these wrong, Malham Cove and Gordale Scar in Yorkshire, Botalac Mine Walk in Cornwall and Lizard Peninsula Circuit, which is also in Cornwall. The top rated walk in Wales is Rossilly Headland in Gower. And in Scotland, it's Anstrother to Crail in Fife. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I did look up the pronunciation of it. Uh, Sean, of those, anything stand out as like any 
camping sites near those? And if you're looking to go on a walk, maybe a longer walk, what should people be looking for when it comes to camping and combining that with a big long walk? So a camp and a walk is a fantastic combination, I think, for a long weekend. And you could look for campsites that were not too far from the beginning of any of these walks set your tent up and then the next morning get up, get yourself to the beginning of the walk. And that's just, for me, that's an amazing day. I have camped on the Lizard Peninsula. I think I've camped near a couple of these, actually. I know Yorkshire has some gorgeous little kind of semi-secret campsites on farms. So if you can seek those out, it's easier than you think to find these campsites if you just have a look online or search um, on a map near a walk you want to do. You can find some really special places. Camping on farms is one of those things I really love the idea of from the Famous Five growing up, where they would go and they'd camp on some angry farmer's uh, farm and buy eggs in the morning. And there's something so lovely about that idea. And I was actually very disappointed growing up just how like few smugglers I encountered because <laughs> of the, the, like, the unrealistic <laughs> expectations of the Famous Five books. Do you know what? I've never met a smuggler that I know of, (laughs) but I have camped at quite a few farms where they have um, a little shop or even an honesty box and you can get bacon, fresh eggs. Sometimes they'll even make you a coffee. In the summer, you can find some some good little pop-ups in campsites. And campsites are getting a bit bougie now, so they even do things like a little supper club that springs up. There's some quite cool stuff out there. Um, So, yeah, if you go to the, the slightly posher end of the market, there's some really gorgeous sites out there on farms. If we've got time for it, I should talk about my really bougie camping experience last week. So last Thursday, I was in the Sahara Desert camping in a fairly bougie tent in that it had a a double bed in it. And also then we were all fed a massive, great big meal and cooked bread in the traditional Berber style on a campfire two and a half miles from anywhere. And the thing that really got me was that you could just see the stars and so many stars that you just don't get and probably camping is one of the only ways you can really get out and see stars now i actually think glamping i'd call that glamping if if that's all right oh completely i think glamping gets a bit of a bad rep as being a bit too posh for those hardcore campers but i actually think glamping is lovely because it's comfortable you can have a good night's sleep on a decent double bed your back's not going to hurt in the morning get up have a hot shower you're still in nature and i definitely have friends who would not be seen dead camping with me but I could probably convince them to go glamping with me so it's like a gateway drug into proper camping (laughs) but you know what I've I've noticed recently because we've done a lot of festivals and we've camped and we've glamped and um, when we went to recently we got the glamping option and honestly this year we're going to go to the same place and we're going to camp because the facilities they just weren't very good and I think for the price that you're paying to glamp you may as well just camp if you've already got the gear well on the subject of gear After the break, we're going to look at what the very best stuff is to make it feel like you're glamping, even if you bring your own stuff. And I will be talking to Joel about how to choose that very best tent on the market. So don't go away. Last minute escapes. In the sun. What is the best airline? Or the worst airline? What happens if my flight is delayed? Or cancelled? Would I be put on a new flight? Or would I be refunded? What if it takes me days to get home? Hmm, benefits of a UK staycation. When life gives you questions, get answers at which.co.uk. Welcome back. Before we press on, our next episode is going to be all about how to get the best night's sleep indoors. So I'll explain more at the end of the show, but we'd love you to get in touch with your questions about mattresses, sleep aids and the general art of sleeping. Right, Joel, thank you for setting up the tent, guiding us through that. We're going to talk about buying stuff. Mm -hmm. Before we do, what are your credentials in the world of camping? You're in the witch testing team, but you're also a camper in your own right. Yes, so I'm a senior researcher for Witch and I look after all things tents, all things camping. So I look after sleeping bags, torches, stuff like that. I would say I'm a big camper. I'm not a Bear Grylls type. I like to camp in relative comfort. I'm not too far the other way either. I've never really understood the whole like bringing your whole house with you <laughs> camping. I think a big part of the appeal is the simplicity. You know, you've got a place to sleep, you've got a place to cook, and that's all you need. I feel like the point is to just kind of enjoy being outside, appreciate good food, good company. I love outdoor cooking as well. Cooking with fire is just a joy. So yeah, I try to get out and camp every year. 
mostly around the UK. The Lake District, I think I'll get a shout out for the Lake District because it's one of, one of my favourite places. Some of the lakeside campsites are fantastic. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll agree with Sean as well that Cornwall is a wonderful place to camp, some of the seaside campsites, as long as you're not bearing the brunt of the wind from the sea too much. Somewhere slightly sheltered is, is probably a good spot to go. Sean, Joel, what's the shopping list? What are the essential things that you're going to need when you're camping? I'm assuming on the top of the list is a tent. What else is there on that list? A sleeping bag. Definitely a sleeping bag, a good mat. A torch, good torch. Usually a head torch, could also be a handheld torch, depending on your preference. I would say a little pillow. You could even bring your pillow from home, but just a little camping pillow does make all the difference. I do that, you know. If I can, I always (laughs) take my pillow from home because it just brings a little bit of extra comfort. What about an airbed? Because some people swear by them, but do you reckon you need one? Uh... It depends on what your requirements are for weight and how much space you have. It is a personal preference thing. I used to use airbeds, but now I'm really into those self-inflating mats. So there's like little nozzles on the end where you kind of open it and then just leave it. And um, there's kind of like a foam layer on the inside that kind of inflates slightly. You get about sort of 10 centimetres worth of kind of padding underneath you. I, I much prefer those. I find them much more reliable. Airbeds, there's just been too many times where you try and pump it up. You bring one of those um, little battery powered pumps to try and like get it onto the airbed to pump it up and it always just keeps coming off. Yeah. <laughs> you end up having to like finish inflating it with your mouth and then, <laughs> and then you wake up in the morning and your, your back's on the floor. So kit shouldn't be something holding people back. Top of that list really was a tent. Joel, how are you finding a good tent and what does Witch do to make sure that people do find a good tent? So Witch tests tents every year from kind of compact two-person tents, like the one that we've just set up in the studio, right up to kind of massive inflatable air tents. The aim is to always cover a kind of broad range of shapes and sizes and types. It really depends on your purpose, like what kind of camping you want to do. And because of that, there's so much variety. When we're testing tents, there are so many out there that it's impossible for us to test every single one. So the way we do it is we kind of keep track of the most popular brands and retailers, see what they're putting out each year. And then we kind of put together a a varied selection of tents to kind of suit different campers. We also look for new trends. I mentioned air tents before. They're becoming really, really popular. What are tents? Oh, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) So these these tents you speak of. uh, Some kind of little house, are they? Uh, (laughs) um, Yeah, so what, what are air tents? So with an air tent, there are no poles. You basically need to pump up the frame of the tent. It's almost like a kind of hybrid bouncy castle, but the floor is not bouncy. I think people are drawn to them because they're much easier to put up in that way. You're not having to fiddle around with the poles and try and feed through the canvas or anything like that. But they can still be quite challenging to put away. When you kind of take the little nozzle off and all the air kind of flies out, most of the time the air doesn't come out fully. So it's a little bit like an airbed where you're going to have to sort of, you know, roll around on it and push it and to try and get all the air out. Because if you don't, then they can be a nightmare to pack away back into the bag. But are they as hard as those tents where you have to like, you know, it's like a circle and you have to like fold it? in on itself the pop and it's up. Pop great, up a pop-up tent yes. yeah putting yeah. away a pop-up tent yeah. it's got to be one of the hardest things in life yeah they can be really difficult to put away and um there are fewer and fewer pop-up tents around now because of the popularity of air tents they're kind of replacing the pop-up tents so we have tested pop-up tents before but i don't think we've lined up any pop-up tents to test for this year because there aren't any new ones what about size how do people pick a, a tent that's right for them A good rule of thumb when you're picking a tent is to always go one size up from the number of campers in your group. So if it's a two-person tent, buy one for three people. I'm not sure why, but when manufacturers list tent sizes in the numbers of people that they say can can sleep in it, they seem to imagine the campers kind of packed in like sardines. If you want a comfortable amount of room and somewhere to put a bag or, or anything like that, go one size up. That is the traditional camping experience is that you go two man tent or six man tent and then you try and fit a whole group of people. And it's like, no, there really isn't room in that. I've had tents in the past that have like a living room. Is that something that's useful? Is that something that you're you know, looking out for when you're testing and, and Chan that you use in your, your time? So you can get tents that have separate living rooms. They even have kind of 
porticos and antechambers you can get really fancy those are great I think for family camping because you can have separate bedrooms maybe one for the kids you can have a living room for all your stuff you can have a kind of covered porch where you could store cooking kit things like that muddy wellies so if you don't mind a bit more weight and room and again yeah the faff of putting them up those big heavy tents do take a bit longer to put up but if you were going on a week-long family holiday they would be well worth it for the space to relax in and if it pours with rain you can sit and have a beer and watch the rain from your lovely living room so definitely yes for bigger longer trips and i feel like we should have the public service announcement here do not cook in the living room of your tent do not cook in a tent you absolutely do not want to cook inside a tent or an enclosed space because you can give yourself carbon monoxide poisoning so you always want to cook outside al fresco even if it's pouring with rain i'm afraid thank you very much what else are you testing tents based on joel so principally resistance to weather every year the tents go through a week's testing in a in a campsite in surrey called etherly farm wonderful farm campsite as you were saying before there's a there's a little farm shop on there they sell all of the farm's produce and if you're barbecuing really really good hang on so you kind of get to go on a camping trip for work (laughs) and just camp for a week at a farm it's not quite as glamorous as that mostly because when we do our tests we test when the campsite is closed for the winter so there's no barbecuing then the winter weather is very much in full flow so all the tents are pitched at the start of the week taken down at the end and they basically just have to experience everything that the british weather can throw at them over the years we've had gale force winds we've had thunderstorms we've had snow yeah and when we arrive at the campsite it's usually a bit of a muddy quagmire so we just have to get our wellies on and get stuck in So it's the ideal conditions for pushing the tents to their limits. With waterproofing, you might be familiar with hydrostatic head. So when you're shopping for tents, there'll be a rating that will be called the hydrostatic head, which you might think is the sort of amount of rainfall that the tent will be able to deal with before the canvas gives way. But it's all to do with how they're tested, and it's really strange. And the same test is done for waterproof coats and anything like that. Essentially, you get a really big, tall column and you you place it on top of the canvas and you slowly fill it up with water, kind of like a transparent drain pipe. And however tall the column of water gets, that's the hydrostatic head rating. So if it fills up to 2,000 millimetres tall, then the hydrostatic head rating is 2,000 millimetres. So it's like the water pressure that it can withstand. exactly. But it can be quite confusing when you're shopping because you can't quite understand what that means in real terms. So when we're testing... The hydrostatic head rating is something that we will sort of sense check, but we often find that regardless of how kind of high or low up to a point the hydrostatic head rating is, most of the time the canvas is fine. When tents leak, they always seem to leak around the seams and around the zips. So when we're setting up the tents for a week's long testing, get put through the the, the weather conditions, that's much more of a kind of real real life test if that makes sense because if you're doing this if you're just doing this hydrostatic head test on the canvas and it doesn't leak that doesn't really tell you the whole picture I actually find it really frustrating that there's quite a lot of techie jargon around tents because I think it can be confusing. I find hydrostatic head quite confusing as a really rough rule you get the higher the hydrostatic head which is often written as HH the better the tent but as Joel says it's not really true when you're testing definitely I think all tents will eventually leak if you take them into the most insane monsoon ever they will eventually get some water in because they are made of fabric but a decent tent will hold out for much longer they do tend to seem to leak on me in the corners and you get puddles in the corners and even really great tents that I've tested have sometimes given up the ghost so I do think with tents it is a good idea to spend money on something that is decent quality and that does have a high hydrostatic head you're more likely to keep going without flooding. Joel, would you agree with that? Do you think you need to spend a lot of money to get a good tent? Well, to find a lot of money. I think that if you go super, super cheap and it's a really kind of low hydrostatic head rating, it's unlikely to put up with much more than like a light rain shower. I think that there's a certain point at which you will need to spend a bit of money for something that's going to last as long as you look after it. As Sean says, every tent's going to give up the ghost eventually. If you're kind of battering it around and sort of, you know, knocking into it and not treating it particularly well, then then yeah, the waterproofing will give up a little bit sooner. What yeah. I would just add on that is that if you were going to a festival on a July weekend and you didn't want to spend loads of money, no problem. Pick something cheap and cheerful. It'll be absolutely fine. It will withstand light rainfall. You will have a great time. If you are going to camp on the side of Snowdonia, I would 
would say look at investing something in something that will protect you effectively from the rain. So the tent that you guys have just put up, how much are we talking about there? How much did that cost? So that tent is between four or five hundred pounds. It's a kind of high end for tents. But as we said at the beginning, this is more for backpacking. So it's much more for your kind of more Bear Grylls-esque sort of serious camper. But tents can really, really vary in price. And um, price doesn't necessarily scale with the hydrostatic head rating. As a baseline, I would say if you're going for about 3,000 millimetres, you're going to be fine in most British weather, unless you're, you know, going somewhere a little bit more extreme or the weather is particularly bad. Anything around that point or higher, you're good. Yeah, so you were, you were paying for that tiny package that it came in really, really lightweight. That must cost a little bit of money as well. Yes. Tents that are particularly light, packed down particularly small. The poles on this tent, I think they're made of carbon fibre as well. So they're also a lot lighter than your sort of standard metal poles. So yeah, all of these things are kind of, they'll, they'll contribute towards the price of the tent, along with the brand, obviously. So, I, and I, you're going to hate me for saying this, but what really should people be looking at spending if they're just starting out in camping? Maybe they're going to a campsite, maybe it's April, they are looking for, say, a three-man tent. Where's the price point where you're thinking you're better off spending a bit more money here, do you think? Really, for me, it is about what you can afford because I would rather people got out and went camping and had a good time than felt put off by price. If you said, I've got a bit of a budget and I would like something that will last me for you know a couple of summers of holidays with two people, yep, I would see a three-man tent and I would probably be spending about 200 quid. That's good to know. And and are there ways of saving money on this? A bit of a broad question, but can you buy these secondhand? I certainly know people who've tried camping and haven't loved it and have put their tents on, you know, Facebook marketplace, that kind of thing. So I, I would imagine there's a good secondhand market for tents and camping equipment. The other thing I'd say is I have a canvas bell tent that I really love, which wasn't cheap. It was about 500 quid, but I've used it loads and loads of summers. It's gotten a bit mouldy and I had it professionally cleaned for 100 quid, which is quite a lot, but it means that it looks brand new and it's in really good condition. So it can now keep coming along with me for festivals and holidays for hopefully for a year to come. Uh, it's good to know that stuff can last. If it's built to last, it can last. Any final things that you love to bring when you go camping that people wouldn't necessarily expect? This is going to be a bit of a boring answer. I always take a multi-tool, <laughs> so like a Swiss Army knife, something like that. Super handy if something breaks and needs repairing or if you've forgotten your bottle opener. Yeah, I never go camping without mine. Most multi-tools have a little kind of multi-purpose hook as well, which is really handy for getting tent pegs out of the ground. If they're kind of stuck in and, you know, you're, it's a bit cold or wet or whatever, you don't want to use your fingers. I also love to take a quick drying towel you can get ones that are made of like microfiber cloth. They pack down like really small, really light, and they're super quick drying. So they're very handy, especially if it's kind of damp conditions, because normal towels, as comfortable and lovely and fluffy as they are, they can take forever to dry. Very Hitchhiker's Guide. Any more bougie items there? So for camping in a campsite, I would bring a small portable fire pit because it's such a treat to have a little fire. You can bring some marshmallows. You've got yourself a fun evening. And for wild camping, I would probably bring a book because sometimes it gets dark quite early and you're like, oh, OK, book or a podcast to keep you going. This podcast. Yeah, yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> if you are listening to this on a campsite, please do let us know. Thanks both of you for joining us. Sean, where can people find you online? Where is your blog? So my blog is thegirloutdoors.com and you can find me on Instagram at Sean Anna Lewis. Fantastic. Joel, Sean, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you so you. much. If you do want to know which tents do best in our tests, head to the Witch website and take out a subscription. We also test kayaks, paddle boards. Honestly, the list goes on. And I will genuinely say this is like one of the best reasons to get a Witch subscription is making those kind of big purchases like that where things are tested in an actual human being environment and not using, as Joel was talking about, hydrostatic heads. Absolutely. <laughs> Next time, we're talking about sleep. It is mattresses, sleeping aids, lifestyle habits, everything that can affect the quality of your sleep. So we'll be getting answers from the experts to help you sleep better. It's estimated that one in three adults have trouble sleeping. Are you one of these people? Then we would love you to get in touch with your questions and we will do our absolute best to answer them. Email us at podcasts at witch.co.uk. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok and X at Witch UK. So do give us a follow. 
And as we mentioned earlier, if you are able to leave us a rating and a review, it would really help us grow and we will be forever grateful. Today's Good Answers was presented by me, Harry Kind, alongside Grace Farrell, produced by Rob Lilly jones and Adrian Bradley, recorded by Adrian and edited by Eric Greer. And thanks again to our wonderful guests, Sean Lewis and Joel Bates. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Hi, Lee Cheer here, host of the Witch Money podcast. Join us each week as we bring you the best experts and top advice to help you make the most of your money. From property prices to budgeting, investment platforms to pensions, we'll be here to keep you informed. Here's a taste of what you can expect. If you had invested £100 in the fund three years ago, you'd have just £61 today. Gosh. Is it worth trusting a website that you don't know to save that 10p, that 20p. The good news is it does look like we're hovering around the top of the interest rate hike cycle. If I asked you what you earned here, you'd be absolutely horrified because we're told we should not talk about money. Make sure to join us for new episodes every Friday and I'll see you then.